Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, our two-part webinar series. <coughs> Excuse me. The first one will be, uh, as you can see from the title of the slide, uh, regarding confidentiality considerations uh, and federal funding requ requirements. Uh, and then we're going to be following that up with a second uh, webinar next week, same time, uh, same bat channel, uh, regarding services uh, to minors, and we'll be focus, focusing mostly on, on teens, um, but uh, you'll see as we go through why we felt like these topics um, relate so well together, and we thought if we're going to do one webinar, um, we should might as well talk about uh, the services to teens, because certainly that's a question uh, that is a very common technical assistance question we receive here at WACASA, and also one in which, uh, for those of you who have um, wrestled with that issue, recognize there's not a lot of um, legal guidance on that particular issue, but we're going we're gonna to spend some time talking about that next week. Uh, but today I wanted to start with confidentiality and the uh, provisions in the two of the major funding streams that fund uh, service provision uh, for sexual assault victims in the state, and that would be funds uh, administered by or uh, the Office on Violence Against Women also known as VAWA funds, um, although one thing to note is they may not be called that. You, you may not see that the, the name of the funding stream is called VAWA. We're going to use that language, but it may, in your community, be uh, SASP or Sexual Assault Service Provider Money. That's not exactly the right acronym. Does anyone know what the SASP, the federal SASP acronym? We'll get that to you. It gets confusing because there's SASP funding stream and then obviously SASPs are uh, sexual assault service providers in Wisconsin. It can also be, it would be money that would come from the Wisconsin uh, Department of Justice. So we're going to talk about that uh, today. Uh, and But before we even get into that, we're just going to sort of ground ourselves in confidentiality. It's something I think is obviously uh, not a, a new topic, um, but we just want to talk about why, why this is important before we get into the uh, nuts and bolts of the uh, the legal language and some of the implications, uh, which I think will be the most uh, where we'll spend most of our time. So, what's the implications of of these provisions? But before we do that, I just want to bring in uh, my co-presenter Kelly to introduce uh, yourself. This is Ian, by the way. I guess I never introduced myself. This is Ian Henderson from uh, Wakasa. Good morning, everyone. This is Kelly, also from Wakasa, and I'll just like throw in a few housekeeping items. We have our um, awesome Wakasa staff here monitoring and making sure, you, if you know Ian and I, you may know that we're not the techiest folks in the office. So uh, we've got Peter Fiala here who is uh, monitoring the tech stuff. So if you have any um, tech issues, he can hopefully help help with that. And Rose Hennessy is um, is monitoring the, um, the text, uh, the questions and things like that. So she's going to um, keep an eye on that. So if you have questions, please feel free to type them in the box, and we will get to them uh, get to them as as they come up or at the end, sort of depending on depending on timing. So um, if you're having any technical difficulties, you can also put that into into the chat. Um, and we also have other Wakasa staff, Naomi and Lynn, also joining us. So um, thanks everybody, and we'll get started. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, one other note I just want to let folks know. Some of you um, may know that uh, WACASA and End Abuse Wisconsin sort of rolled this information out uh, back in September at the, uh, the joint directors meeting. Uh, and so obviously that information went to um, the directors who attended that meeting. But what we wanted to do, and both coalitions uh, spend a lot of time in the lead up to the directors meeting and have been <coughs> really in, in dialogue since then is make sure we're getting the information out beyond uh, the directors and, and starting to get this information out to advocates as well. So for, for those of you who may be directors uh, who are on the call and were at the meeting, some of this may be uh, review, but we're excited to, um, to talk about this and the, so the sort of broader implications and, and to get the information out uh, beyond the director's level to some of the, the advocates. And for advocates uh, on the phone or on the webinar, um, that might be something you want to check back in with your director about, because obviously some of the things we'll be talking about in terms of agency policy and decisions would be things that obviously we would need uh, directors to be involved with. So um, just want to 
point that out, and then really that this is a, a follow-up uh, training uh, to the, the information presented at the director's meeting. And I know NWS has been doing, and Tess, who's my uh, colleague at NWS, has been doing uh, tra regional trainings uh, for directors as well. So we're doing this uh, definitely in, uh, in partnership with NWS and has spent a lot of time with them talking about uh, these issues and making sure we're getting uh, information out to the programs on these issues. So without further ado, let's move on and talk about uh, why confidentiality is important. And I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on this particular issue because I think this is fairly, uh, fairly obvious and I think will be, most familiar, will be familiar to uh, most folks on the uh, on the on the line, but I think it's a useful starting point, and and we'll see why we're starting here in a in a minute. But I think confidentiality confidentiality is important, and that it builds trust with your with survivors we're working with. It can enhance physical safety if survivors uh, have relocated as a result of the assault and who want to keep that uh, their physical location confidential. Uh, it enhances emotional safety in allowing uh, victims of safe place to work through. Uh, shame and guilt and the feelings they may be experiencing as a result of the sexual assault. Um, so I think that's uh, critical information as to why, uh, why confidentiality is important. And again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here on that particular issue. Uh, however, I think why it's important to start here is recognizing that I think this is also where uh, the federal government uh, is coming from by attaching these grant conditions that we're going to be talking about in a, in a minute to, uh, to, the, to the funds that fund direct services, right? VAWA and the Office of Violence Against Women and the FIPSA funding, which is the uh, funding that uh, funds some domestic abuse services here in Wisconsin. <clears throat> those, uh, by, by attaching those grant conditions, I think are really emphasizing and underscoring the importance of confidential services, right? And why uh, that's so critical to the survivors that we, uh, that we work with. And so what, you know, what protects confidentiality? Well, the first bullet point is what we're talking about today, right? Funding streams that require that as a condition of receiving that, that money. Privilege laws. I'm sure you all are familiar with, in Wisconsin, we have the victim advocate <coughs> survivor privilege that protects the confidential communications between survivors and advocates and allows that information to be kept confidential and to be kept out of court proceedings. <coughs> I'm sure many of you have agency policies, or most of you, I'm sure, that state that you provide and, and offer confidential services. And then other things such as ethical obligations and uh, record keeping, which we're not going to spend as much time uh, on talking about today. We're really going to be focusing on that first bullet point, but I want to recognize that there's a variety of things that really allow the services that we provide to be protected and to allow that information to, and the privacy of victim information to be kept uh, confidential. So these are really uh, tools, if you want, that agencies and advocates can utilize to uh, refer to when someone may be asking, well, how can you keep that information confidential? These are the various things that, that require that. So now we're going to shift to um, the Violence Against Women Act, and you have the citation up there. And One of the things I think it's important to note is um, that I've got VAWA 2005 and the 2013 reauthorization. So what I want to emphasize today is that this information really is not new information. There has been, with the 2013 reauthorization, I think a renewed emphasis uh, by OVW, the Office of Violence Against Women, um, about confidentiality. And so I think that's why maybe there's some of this heightened attention to it. And I think certainly um, it's not something we were paying as close attention to as a coalition. And when we met with, uh, with end abuse as we were, you know, sort of looking at the VAWA 2013 reauthorization, we realized that, A, A this wasn't really that new, and maybe we should have been uh, really having these conversations even longer ago. But I think there also was some renewed, uh, renewed emphasis by OVW. And so I think uh, that's one thing I want to uh, just signify up front that this is not really new. And second, I think, importantly, would be that um, 
I think when you go when we go through the the, the real fundamental principles here, you'll realize that it's the practices that they're alluding to are things you're probably already doing as well. Um, that this is not maybe the huge sea change that maybe we thought it was going to be. Uh, when you really look at what it's what VAWA is saying, I think there's some questions as you get down into the weeds, so to speak, and there's some, uh, and we're going to talk about that as we go through the webinar, where there's maybe some challenges. Um, but I also want to uh, let you all know that really, I think when you when you look at this information, it's not really saying anything that groundbreaking. And I think it's really um, what VAWA is aspiring to and trying to emphasize is, is best practice. Uh, that you know um, they're coming from the place of wanting to strengthen the privacy and confidentiality of sexual assault victims and domestic abuse victims' information. And I think when we start from that point, we can, I would imagine, all agree that that's a, a, that's a good starting point and that we think that's uh, important, right? Uh, we know sexual assault survivors, the concerns over the privacy of their information is really paramount after an assault. So I think understanding that VAWA um, is recognizing that and uh, making a real policy decision by attaching these grant conditions is, is, a, is, a, is really aspiring to best practice. But we'll see as we go through that you know there may be some some challenging areas when we start looking at the details. So here's what VAWA says as the grant condition. And I think again, when we look at this, this information should not be anything that probably is not a new is, is new or not something that you're already doing. Uh, and basically it says that grantees may not disclose, reveal, or release personally identifying information or individual information without the informed, written, reasonably time-limited consent of your client or of the victim, right? So don't release information without a signed release of information, uh, which is a lot of release of information in one sentence. But <laughs> what I mean there is like don't reveal information without the client signing a release, right? Um, what gets tricky here is the use of reveal and release and then the release being a thing, but right at, at its bay, at its core, what Bob is saying is don't disclose information without the client signing a release of information, which I'm sure all your agencies have those forms. And we'll talk a little bit about releases in a minute. Uh, second bullet point is also important, and you can see this is why we decided, one of the reasons we decided to look at a second part webinar about services to minors, because it also says in the case of an unemancipated minor, which would be most children in Wisconsin, uh, very few uh, minors are emancipated, the release has to be signed, the release of information needs to be signed by the minor and the parent or guardian of the minor. So, right, in case when, if, a, if you're providing services to <coughs> either uh, a teen, for example, and a mom as secondary survivor, or mom and dad as secondary survivors, revealing information or about that minor client needs the consent of both uh, individuals. <clears throat> and then that last uh, point at the end of the slide about <clears throat> that consent for the release, <clears throat> excuse me, for the release of information may not be given by the, either the abuser of the minor or other parent of the minor. Now, one thing to note uh, is that you notice they just use the phrase unemancipated minor, which really can mean anyone under the age of 18, right? And I think when we're talking about teens, it might be, it might be easier to conceptualize, okay, if I'm having a conversation with a 16-year-old, I could talk about what, you know, that, that person needs to give permission, as opposed to a conversation with a 3-year-old, right? What might be very different, but you'll note that not, the law does not make a distinction based on age. So here's where one of the you know one of the issues uh, potentially would involve of, of not giving a lot of framework or guidance on how um, programs would address this issue with minors who may not be developmentally cap capable of signing a release of information. But note that the language is, and this is one of the things we'll see with VAWA, the language is very uh, straightforward uh, and black and white. Yet, we recognize there's a difference between uh, a six-year-old and a 16-year-old. 
Okay, sounds like we have a question. All right, we have a question that says... What All right, we have a question that says, what if the minor doesn't want to talk to their parents, doesn't want to talk to their parents about what uh, you talk with them about? That's a great question, and without um, wanting to completely punt on that today, what I would encourage uh, you is that kind of hook to come back next week because uh, it is absolutely going to be a part, a key part of our webinar next week. And if you can't join us next week, of course, this web, that webinar will also be recorded and available on our website. Uh, but really, that takes us firmly into, uh, into next week. It's a great question, and we're going to talk about that. I mean, the short answer is Wisconsin law doesn't really give programs a lot of <coughs> guidance on that issue and so um, we're going to talk about that and that's something that agencies need to think about in terms of providing services to minors that ability to keep information confidential so uh, great question uh, and please tune in uh, tune in next week for discussion about that I will say there's not a definitive answer so uh, <laughs> way to sell it foreshadowing uh, <laughs> we will also like write it down so we make sure that if we if we don't answer it as clearly as we possibly can, we will sort of put it in the parking lot for next for next week. So we don't want to like lose it in any way. Yeah, make no, sure and it, it is such a key part of that next webinar because not only you know when we're talking about services to minors, there's the issue of is parental consent required and what about confidentiality? When Wisconsin law is silent on that with respect to domestic abuse and sexual assault programs, right? We're going to look at next week other areas of the law and talk about what areas minors might, uh, what services minors can access confidentially uh, and what uh, and without parental consent. Not that that's answering the question for programs, but it's trying to at least uh, allude to there are situations not in our law and our legal system has recognized areas where minors do have the ability to access certain services and to do so confidentially and without parental consent. And then we're going to also talk about um, some other states and how other states have, have addressed that. At what age mm -hmm. the emancipated child has to, or unemancipated? No, no, and that's what the law does not. Uh, and the law just uses the word unemancipated minor. That's that's one of the things that I. That's a that's a really good question, and the law does not address how to deal with the differences between an unemancipated six-year-old versus an unemancipated 16-year-old. They're all treated the same. OK. Good questions. So now moving on. Uh, trying to move on. <laughs> OK, there we go. So um, you'll notice that the, right, the, the last slide talks about re releasing that personally identifying information or individual information with, right? And so what is that? <clears throat> well, VAWA uh, does give some guidance on that or, or some language about what that is. <clears throat> it basically means any information for or about an, an individual likely to disclose the location of a victim of sexual assault, domestic abuse, which could include <clears throat> name, address, contact information, driver's license number, or any other info and any other information, that, including the date of birth or racial ethnic background that could serve to identify the person, right? So you see it's, it's broader than just name, right? It includes a lot of other information that could identify that person. Now one thing um, to note is as far as grant reporting, VAWA does allow demographic information to be shared in aggregate to comply with data collection requirements, right? So um, that, uh, that is not prohibited here, but any, any of this information, any personally identifying information, right, you must have the informed, written, or reasonably time-limited consent. One other thing I want to note um, about this is we're talking, we're talking a lot about federal law today. I do want to uh, just mention that for uh, dual programs, there is another uh, state law that operates uh, to protect confidentia confidentiality, and that's the waiver of non-disclosure. Now, for sexual assault, for standalone sexual assault programs, that's not something 
that you need to uh, worry about. Uh, but for dual programs, all right, there is that additional state law that that uh, is something that clients need to sign that waiver of non-disclosure before releasing information. And again, for questions really about that, I want to allude to it. Um, certainly, end abuse and tests uh, are really uh, experts on that. But I just didn't want to gloss over because I'm sure we're talking and, and know, in fact, we have some dual programs on the phone as well. OK, so that's personally identifying information. We've talked about that. Uh, releases of information. And again, this information here um, is not new either. And certainly, it's something that's a core part of our confidentiality presentation at Savis, <coughs> our victim advo advocacy school on releases, releases of information, right? And the VAWA says they must be informed, written, reasonably time limited. And I think what we're saying uh, on that, and although VAWA doesn't specify what that means, we are promoting that 15 to 30 day time limit uh, and revocable release of information. And that services may not con be conditioned upon a victim signing of a release. And really, that release of information should be sufficiently specific. And that's getting at that informed part. Because an informed release is one that I think, or and that we think, uh, states what is going to be released, what information is going to be released, for what purpose, why the information is being released, and to whom. Right, And I think that is really what VAWA is um, emphasizing here on that, on the releases of information, that our releases really need to be specific, because that's really going to protect the privacy of, of client information. <clears throat> and um, I don't know, Kelly, if you want to talk about, you know, from an advocacy sp perspective, what you think uh, the implications of this, or from your experience with releases. I think you know we've done some regional trainings, and you know at Savis we we get some feedback on this, and it, it is challenging, especially when you think of that 15 to 30 day um, recommended time limit on on releases. It does potentially put some burden on the advocate and the organization to be getting releases signed more frequently. Which you know uh, when we when we're dealing with survivors who have transportation issues, when we have programs uh, covering you know large multi-county service areas that that these things can, you know, can uh, increase some, some difficulties for programs and, and how they're doing this. And I think our message, um, and I know from from doing the work in a seven county service area, and uh, you know, understanding that, um, we just always tried to go back to that best practice um, uh, perspective, even if it meant an inconvenience. And that can be um, that can be challenging because it, it doesn't seem. Uh, like it helps with the functionality of how you're providing services, but I think we believe so strongly in protecting confidentiality and and following uh, the the intent and philosophy behind VAWA that we we um, deal with the inconvenience uh, to to stay true to to this. And I think um, sometimes that can be challenging. So just trying to kind of remind ourselves of that and why it's so important. Right. And it's really at the core of advocacy and the core of what we do. So we, you know, you just kind of go through the jump over the hurdles right. as. <laughs> as they come up. Right, exactly. And I think, uh, again, with releases of information, I think the inf the, I, I'm really stressing that informed, because I think most of us have the written, and I think I'm hearing less and less of longer. I think I'm hearing it seeming like programs are, uh, the message has gotten out and releases, that time period is, uh, is, is shorter. Um, but that informed piece is, is a point I really want to emphasize uh, in that you know, the release should be signed only in contemplation of actually revealing information. Um, it doesn't mean you have to, and certainly that revocable piece uh, allows the client to, to withdraw that consent. But having that, you know, moving away from a practice of, let's just get the client to sign a release of who, who might we need to talk about, and we've got it. I really think VAWA is, is wanting it, this, us to move away from that practice, uh, recognizing what Kelly talked about, that at times that can be um, it can be inconvenient. Uh, but I think when we step back from that and look at why, again, it's about protecting confidentiality. So I think that's it's really important. The other piece I'll say about this uh, before moving on would be, uh, again, I think most programs this is not a, are familiar with this of how you're going to respond to releases from other agencies. 
So you know, your client might call or another service provider says, hey, your client signed a release for me, for you to talk to me. You know, how you're going to handle that, again, I think what Val is saying, despite that release, you want that client to sign your own release of information, right? And VAW is, is requiring that. And I think the importance of, of that is, A, VAWA, but B, like being, so you're able to have a conversation with the survivor to see, like, exactly what that, um, what you're supposed to be releasing, you know, what they are comfortable with you talking to. So if it's a, a system partner or a, you know, as Ian said, another service provider, that doesn't necessarily mean even if they signed the release on the other end, uh, you don't know how well informed it was. You don't know what kind of information that they shared on, on their end, as well as you don't know what sort of information they want shared and what information they don't want shared. So I think it's just really important to have that conversation so you're getting, uh, you're able to provide that informed and specific I information so you know what's appropriate for you to share. Right, exactly. Okay. <clears throat> So now we are um, kind of moving into the, the, the meat of the uh, conversation here where we're going to get into some of the um, more controversial is the right word, but maybe challenging aspects of, of the VAWA funding conditions. And that <coughs> VAWA does have exceptions listed. Uh, and it says that uh, if the release of information, uh, meaning if revealing information, right, that's that confusing release of information and the release is a thing, right? But if revealing information is compelled by a statutory or court mandate, then the grantees shall do uh, two things, basically. They must make a reasonable attempt to provide notice to victims affected by the disclosure. Again, I think best practice, right? If you have to do, if you have to disclose information, you want to, need to make an attempt to tell the, the person, uh, affected by that, that you're doing that, and that you take those ne steps necessary to protect the privacy and safety of the persons affected by that release of information, right? So I think what, you know, what they're getting at there is you may need to release information or reveal information or disclose information, but to do so in a way that's letting the person know and, and only releasing as much information as you need to to comply with either the statute or court mandate. And then you still try and be sensitive and protect the privacy and the confidentiality of other information that's not required to be revealed. <clears throat> so let's talk about statutory uh, or court mandates and what we're, what, what we're talking about there. And we're going to focus most of the webinar today on that first uh, part of the clause, with the statutory mandate. And really what we're talking about there would be reports of abuse and neglect and reports of child abuse and neglect. Uh, we also have mandatory reporting obligations for individuals at risk, although that operates differently um, and in Wisconsin. And without going too deep into that, you know, uh, probably you all are familiar that that report, there is mandatory reporting for those populations, although there are opt-outs for those reporters. <clears throat> that does not exist in child abuse and neglect. And that's why we're going to spend most of uh, today talking about uh, child abuse and neglect reports. The other part of that court mandate would be a court order, right? So the court ordering a program to disclose information. And then lastly, right, uh, this was, this last point on the slide is what VAWA, this was added to VAWA 2013. Again, it doesn't say anything new, um, but that nothing in the VAWA grant conditions prohibits reporting abuse and neglect as those terms are defined and specifically mandated by state or tribal law. <clears throat> so note that it includes state and tribal law. I know we have some tribal programs uh, on the line. Uh, again, basically stating, right, that the grant conditions are not prohibiting reporting of abuse or neglect as those terms are defined by state law. So again, here we see the interplay between federal law and state law and our mandatory reporting law and specifically mandated. And that those two words are going to become really uh, significant as we uh, go forward. <coughs> mandated by the state or tribal law. OK, <coughs> so now we have this brings us into uh, Wisconsin law, right? You can see that to understand VAWA, we have to be familiar with Wisconsin's mandatory reporting law. And while that's not the focus of today and 
Uh, it's something we certainly talk at length about at trainings. Um, we just need to uh, hit some key points. <coughs> and that only statutory mandated reporters may report without the informed written consent of the client. And so those would be the folks who are listed in Wisconsin Law in Chapter 48 who are mandatory reporters, right? Second, sexual self advocates, domestic abuse advocates are not listed as statutory mandated, mandated reporters under Wisconsin law, right? Nothing new here, right? You all, I'm sure, know this. <clears throat> and lastly would be we also know that some individual staff members at programs may be statutory mandated reporters if they are licensed or certified professionals, right? And key example there would be social workers. I can tell you we spent hours and uh, you know on these issues um, in leading up to uh, the directors meeting and um, but I, you know I think it's it's important just to uh, to understand that right so the statutory mandated reporters don't need that <coughs> release of information um, they have to do these the first two bullet points there. Um, but advocates generally are not mandated reporters under Wisconsin law. Meaning that they would have to get that release. Correct. Yes. <clears throat> Correct. <clears throat> so here becomes one of the, I think, key takeaways <clears throat> from today. And also remember, what I am speaking of and what we're speaking of here is grant conditions attached to VAWA money. And I think we did get the what SASP stands for. It stands for the Sexual Assault Services Formula Grant Program. Uh, they ignored the F in the acronym, and that's fine. Uh, but um, so this applies. These grant conditions are uh, attached to those programs who receive VAWA funding, right? <clears throat> and so ad we've, we've established, right, and you all know advocates are not statutory mandated reporters. And as Kelly just said, therefore, they may not report without the informed written consent of the parent and unemancipated minor, right? That's straight out of VAWA. And so I think here becomes one of the very big implications. And one of the things we, when we read this and spent time with this, we thought, because, you know, this, is, this could be, um, significant for some programs, that agencies that receive VAWA funding may need to reevaluate permissive child abuse reporting policies. And what, I, what we mean by permissive child abuse reporting policies is I know from uh, training at SAVIS and from talking with advocates from across the state that some programs have policies that, that say, um, you know, it, not in these words exactly, but the the take the bottom line is well, we we're not mandated reporters by law, but we're going to follow those laws as if we were. Meaning, we are going to report even though we're not. <clears throat> if you receive VAWA funding, I think those policies uh, would need to be reevaluated because of what uh, what VAWA says, uh, and that's I think one of the big uh, takeaways. I hope. Uh, you all uh, leave with today is that that that's, seems to be in contravention w uh, of what VAW is saying to allow that permissive reporting. <clears throat> and the other funding stream that we talked about is FIPSA. <clears throat> which funds some dual services or funds some dual programs. And 99 or 98 percent of the language in VAWA and FIPSA is the same. However, there's a significant difference uh, in that FIPSA, that exception states that nothing prohibits grantees from reporting abuse and neglect where mandated, and here these three words become very important, or expressly permitted by state law. So that, the use of those words, or expressly permitted, seems to indicate that for programs that receive FIPSA funding, you may continue with pr permissive reporting policies, right? So this becomes important to know what funding streams your agency receives, right? Because FIPSA has that language about <clears throat> 
or expressly permitted by state law. In Wisconsin's mandatory reporting law, uh, it, the, the statute states anyone may report abuse. Well, that's, that's permissive reporting, right? <clears throat> so uh, what happens if a program receives both VAWA and FIPSA? I think, I'm sorry? What is FIPSA? The Family Violence Prevention and FIPSA. Services Act. Thank you. I believe that's exactly right. It is administered by the Department of Children and Families here in Wisconsin. So it's administered by DCF. It funds domestic abuse services. So for sexual assault standalone programs, I don't think that any of them would be receiving FIPSA money. It comes from, it, it, it comes from the federal government and it is passed through by Department of Children and Families here in Wisconsin. Dual programs, many of them, I believe, would receive that funding. VAWA comes from the Office on Violence Against Women at USDOJ, is passed through in Wisconsin by, to the Wisconsin Department of Justice, who then does fund some programs with that money. <clears throat> so, right, there's a, there's a distinction between the two funding uh, funding sources, right? The language is not exactly the same. And I think, uh, Kelly, I don't know if you want to talk about some of your experience with programs or, you know, operating with those grant conditions that say different different things. Yeah, I think it's it's always challenging when you're, you know, you're, you know, everyone's funded. We're, WCAS is funded by multiple different, multiple different grants. And you're trying to manage, you know, so it's, it, especially individual staff. So our staff funds even like are diversified. So I'm not just funded under one grant. I'm funded under five or six different grants or whatever the case may be. So me as a person trying to sort of compartmentalize which part of my work goes under which grant is challenging. But then when you're dealing with conflicting um, language related to those funding sources, it can get it can get really challenging. And so I think this is an unusual for um, for programs to have to deal with. I think we see um, one example would be around like some uh, related to the financial management piece of grant funding, that sometimes grants have different requirements and different expectations. Uh, the one example that comes to mind is the, um, you know, the amount, the percentage of funds that you can move uh, within cat categories without asking for a budget modification. Uh, and what we see in some of our grants is that that percentage is different from grant to grant. So one grant may say you can move 10% of funding uh, within categories. One may say you can move 20% of funds within categories. And so, uh, again, instead of having different rules for different grants and different projects within our organization, we generally decide to follow the more strict uh, version. Because if I'm, um, if I'm a, a grantor and I require you to do 20% and you decide to do 10 which is more strict, then I'm going to be like, hey, that's great. Like, I don't care if you're doing, you know, if you're, if you're choosing the more strict policy. Um, but if I'm the grantor that requires 10% uh, and you are doing 20, then I'm obviously going to, going to have issue with that. So I think uh, when we see those conflicts um, within funding sources, uh, we generally try to, to follow the more strict um, uh, option. And that's exactly, uh, I think, the point that we want to emphasize today is, if you receive both, right, uh, that could certainly be possible for some programs, then what we are stating in, in ter terms of talking with end abuse is that more restrictive, which is the VAWA, which is the language in VAWA, controls. Uh, and so the VAWA provisions would be the ones to follow. <clears throat> so I think, you know, this was part of one of the more controversial aspects of this when we were going through it, recognizing that the potential impact or implication for agencies, agency policies, uh, as a result of these grant conditions. <clears throat> but I want to also now step back from the nuts and bolts here of VAWA and FIPSA and, and again where we started, which is why did these, pro why did OVW, uh, and again I'm getting into their heads, I don't, no one has said that why they've done this, but I can only imagine that the reasons they decided to go this way was something to strengthen private. This is something they could do by attaching these grant conditions to strengthen the privacy and confidentiality of the information of sexual assault and domestic abuse victims. And so if we think about that as being its underlying purpose, <clears throat> again, I think we can agree that's, that's important. Uh, 
And I think what this offers the opportunity for programs, it certainly has, uh, we've had the conversations here, at times heated conversations about the philosophical uh, where, you know, implications of these things. And I think there's certainly room for, for debate here. Um, but I think it poses the opportunity for us to look at our policies and to look at how we are uh, <clears throat> handling certain information, particularly around reporting of child abuse and neglect. So I would say even for programs <coughs> that aren't VAWA funded, that you're FIPSA funded, you're right. You, don't, you are not in, required to follow the VAWA provisions if you don't get the VAWA money. I do think, though, that it does offer the opportunity to evaluate agency policy and to look at whether permissive reporting uh, is serving the best interests of client privacy. And I'm not going to take a position on that here, uh, but I think if we, if we look at VAWA aspiring to best practice, I think that you know, it, this does provide an opportunity for programs and agencies to evaluate their policies, even if you're not required to follow VAWA. I think it's worth thinking about. Uh, so that's my one little, or our one little uh, kind of preachy uh, moment here. Uh, but I'm hoping that <clears throat> we recognize that this particular uh, piece of VAWA was maybe going to be uh, uh, challenging uh, for programs. OK. All right. <clears throat> This is another, I think, situation as we looked at VAWA that we thought, uh, and as I would have talked to advocates about this, um, they've identified this as a, as, a, um, as a challenge, right? That VAWA is very, uh, and FIPSA, true, as well, um, very black and white approach to uh, confidentiality seems to not allow for uh, emergency situations because nothing in either of those uh, laws addresses emergency situations. And when we're talking emergency situations, I mean, there are a myriad of them, right? <clears throat> the ones that I most often hear are uh, the threats of self-harm or some medical emergency, which could be related or, or not necessarily. That what VAWA and FIPSA say is um, you need to have the informed written consent before releasing identifying information. And um, is that practical in emergency situations? Is that practical if <clears throat> the client is unresponsive or unconscious, either at your program or if it's a shelter-based program? How do you get someone to sign <laughs> a written consent? Um, and I think where I, even more so, I think, than the child abuse reporting, I think here is where I think some of the, the language in VAWA does p p pose some real, real issues because it, it requires programs to make some really hard decisions. And they are probably decisions that you already have, either already have made uh, or have contemplated, right? Again, these, these emergency situations are not new. Um, and you may have wrestled with these already. And, and so <clears throat> we don't have any, you know, magic uh, answer or, or crystal ball to tell you how to, to respond to these. I think what we're trying to encourage you all to do is we as a coalition and, uh, and abuse that we've talked about this, we recognize that you know, certain circumstances may compel programs by looking at the situation as a whole to ensure for the client's safety that they receive the appropriate services. And that, that you decide uh, in a certain situation that disclosure of information is necessary for the safety or well-being of the client, despite that required documentation not being in place. I think what we are wanting to encourage programs to do is to, that should be done on a case-by-case basis. It should be done thoughtfully, which I have all faith that you will do that and have done that, uh, and then it's a well-reasoned decision, and that you do release information as minimal as you can to what you feel accomplishes the, the goal, which is perhaps the safety of the client. I don't know, Kelly, you've had, from your experience, you've talked about situations. If you want <coughs> to chime in on, uh, on this, from your experience as an advocate, how you've wrestled with that. Well, I think the first thing is, is trying to um, maybe up front uh, 
be truthful with um, with the people you're serving related to this. So when you're discussing confidentiality, um, letting letting people know what those limitations are. So the limitation related to emergency situations, saying like I'm going to keep this information confidential unless circumstances are compelling me related to you know um, your physical well-being, uh, you know th threats to harm yourself, you know medical emergencies, those sorts of things. So you would be talking with folks in a non-emergency situation about this um, specific uh, sort of a, uh, ex, uh, deviance from your, you know, confidentiality um, policy for your for your agency. Um, at the same time, is is when you're in those, like I've been on those hotline calls where you're, you know, talking with a survivor. Uh, you know, I had an instance where I was talking with a survivor who I knew was a cutter. Um, didn't necessarily assess her as suicidal, someone I had worked with for a really long time, um, and then the phone goes dead. And then what, then what do you do? You know, you try to get her back on the line, you try to get her back on the line, you knew she was in a heightened state of anxiety when you had her on the phone, you know, you're really trying to, um, to, trying to, to do what's best. And I think, um, you know, for me in that situation, I, I, I chose the well-being uh, of the survivor, um, but I didn't sort of, open the door to all of her information. I, I, you know, I placed a phone call, we did a welfare check, you know, to make sure that she was okay. That didn't mean that I was giving away all of her information. It meant that I was giving away as much as ne needed to have her checked in on to make sure that she was okay. And um, so I think that those are the decisions that we make. And having agency policies that address these things, um, that people aren't in those situations to have to handle them um, on their own without, you know, having, having you're not going to be able to come up with every emergency right. situation that's going to yeah. come up. But as an organization, you can talk about, okay, how are we going to handle medical emergencies? How are we going to handle threats of harm? How are we going to assess threats of harm to see, uh, you know, sort of where, where folks are at in doing some suicide assessments um, and making sure staff is trained in that. So I think those are the things you can do on the front end. Um, and then, you know, just, you know, as Ian said, trusting folks to make really, uh, you know, really thoughtful, good decisions uh, when they're faced with these situations. Right. Thanks, Kelly. I think that's exactly right. <clears throat> so, you know, what are some possible consequences of vi violations of the confidentiality mandates? Well, again, you know, it's not unclear. I'm not speaking for either the U.S. DOJ or the Wisconsin Department of Justice. Uh, but, you know, again, I think what I want to emphasize is, you know, there may be circumstances, and we recognize that, in which you feel compelled to reveal uh, information without the, the written consent. And while there's not a guarantee of how funders would respond to that, we would, we would think, and, you know, uh, that funders would work with programs based on, uh, you know, their desire to really assist programs in, in complying with the, the grant conditions that they would work with programs to understand the circumstances surrounding the violation and to assist programs with future compliance. Again, that's not a, not a guarantee, but I don't really have any reason to think otherwise, that this is, there's not confidentiality police out there, right? We, uh, we recognize and, and would think that funders would work with programs uh, to understand that. Um, although, you know, repeated violations uh, may warrant a stronger response, but those, you know, case by case, tough decisions that are well thought out and reasoned, I think, you know, funders would, would want to work with programs to understand that. I, I'm hearing there's a question. Yes, and this is referring to right before the slide. It says, would the same be true for clients who return to shelter under the influence and are harmful to themselves and or others? Well, I, I mean, I guess I, I would say, and Kelly, you know, referenced, there may be any myriad of emergency situations. I don't think we can, you know, I just gave some general examples. That's going to be a case-by-case -case determination. Um, what an emergency situation is going to be is going to very much depend on what's happening and you evaluating the situation and uh, weighing the harm of violating the provisions of VAWA or FIFSA versus the potential harm to clients or others if you don't. And, and again, I, I recognize that's kind of a, a non-answer, um, but really I think it's the best, the best we can do. We, there's no, the emergency situations could be anything, really. Uh, I just gave you, and Kelly talked about some maybe common examples, but I, I don't think there's a limit on what an emergency situation could be. That 
that decision is going to be have to be made case by case, and I would you know again hopefully not by one person that you're you're doing this as a as a team and you're making the best decision you can as an agency. Is there another question? Yes, I'm going to ask for clarification though. Okay, well we'll keep we'll keep going then. Uh, so we talked about uh, the possible consequ consequences, and then I think just uh, really in, in summary, um, I think the, one of the big take homes is to understand what funding your agency receives, right? And uh, if you need help with that, certainly that's something Wakasa can provide. Um, Obviously, our funders, uh, DCF, DO, uh, DOJ, can help with that as well. But obviously, that's important. That's something we've identified as significant uh, uh, today. So I think that's, that's certainly important information. That second bullet point is, again, I think, something you're already doing. You know, Protect confidentiality and, and don't release information without the informed written consent of the client, uh, unless you're in one of those uh, narrow, uh, narrow exceptions. And with respect to emergency situations, you know, do your best, and we trust that you you will do your best, and know that you do. You make these hard decisions every day, uh, and um, that those uh, well thought out decisions, I, you know, without guaranteeing anything, uh, are are unlikely to be uh, punished. I, I guess um, that that decision, particularly when you're balancing those really competing interests. Uh, Sometimes, not always, right, of confidentiality versus uh, potential safety. Well, and I think the other point about that is, is try to, you know, try to, you know, challenge your conversations and challenge yourself when you're going through these to not let the what if, mm -hmm. worst case scenarios sort of um, bring the conversation to a halt or bring you to, a, you know, just a sticking point that you that you can't work through. I think that you can never you know, imagine all of the situations. I mean, you all know this because you're doing this on a day-to-day -day basis, but, uh, you know, we're doing, you know, when I'm doing staff training and I'm talking about, some, you know, some examples of these situations, I can never dream up all of the things that came up, you know, uh, uh, while you're doing this work. So, uh, you know, try to not let that what if this and what if that sort of, like, you know, um, paralyze you to, to you know to not move forward and, right. and making and making decisions and having these conversations right and just to um, reiterate reiterate what something Kelly mentioned um, I'm backing up or trying to because uh, I think I, I glossed over it but I, I really want to um, emphasize that as uh, a really important point here is that that last bullet point on this slide and something Kelly mentioned that really, before you're providing services, you do what Kelly talked about is you're explaining any limitations on confidentiality to your clients and the survivors that you're working with so that they understand the rules of the game, so to speak, uh, prior to disclosing information. So they, they understand when you say our services are confidential, recognizing that maybe not, that's not true in all situations and that you give folks an understanding of what those limits are up front. I had a clarification on the question. Okay. Okay. So, we do have to communicate to parents when we do release information, even though we know that they, the parents at this point, are not supporting the children. And we have to report that? It, it, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not still quite completely, I'm sorry, uh, understanding the, the question. I will say, though, that it's certainly sounding like something that's going to be covered in the webinar next week uh, regarding services to minors. Um, so I think, you know, we'll, I'll take a look at that and we will uh, try and make sure we're covering that and addressing that in the webinar next week. And I think there just there was another question, you know, specifically related to um, uh, to services to minors. Again, we're we're cataloging some of these questions that Rose is seeing come up that that we know we're going to be addressing right. next week. So if you did type in a question that you're like, hey, they didn't they didn't answer my question, right. um, it's because we're sort of you know tabling it with that other one we had earlier as well. Um, so we'll make sure we have those things. And it's it's awesome for us because we're still you know finishing up putting right. that information together, so we can make sure that.
we have this information right. as a part of the next Right, 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 exactly. It's really nice about doing this as a series is that it allows us to fine tune next week based on some of the, the feedback and comments uh, we're getting about that. Cause I, and again, you can see why we paired the topics, right? If you're not talking about service designers, you're missing a big piece of this, and I think you all are, are recognizing that with your questions. So we will absolutely be looking at those and uh, building that information into next week's webinar. And again, if you can't be part of that, it's going to be um, it's going to be recorded, and you know you also know how to reach us. Uh, and if you feel still like your questions aren't answered, and some of these questions are really complex and maybe better answered in a one-on-one -on one-on-one -on -one, uh, -on -one format, so that we can you know do this uh, or to really kind of wrestle with the issues. Uh, that's also an option too, right? We're going to try and cover it in the webinar, but also recognize Kelly and myself uh, are available for technical assistance as well. All right. Were there any other other questions? We've got the ones we need for later. And all right. Okay. Well, that will conclude part one uh, of our webinar series. Uh, I want to thank you all for your questions uh, and look forward to speaking uh, to many of you next week. A reminder, the webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, December 17th. It will be also at 10 a.m. Uh, is there anything else folks need to know about registration or? Nope. Okay. So thank you all and uh, have a good rest of your week.